Good morning, everyone. How are you doing this morning? Good. How about yourself? Pretty good. Pretty good. Thanks for asking. Okay, so let's see. It's nine of us right now. Let's give everybody a minute or two to join. And let's see if you have any questions for me. Yeah, Vafa, I have a quick question. Go ahead. Um, so for the Excel assignment that was due on Tuesday, I know that I turned it in this morning because you gave me an extension. Um, I may have encountered an error with um, with one or with a couple of the questions, mm -hmm. um, like because it had to do with the formulas, like V look, uh, H look up, B look up, the match formula. Mm -hmm. um, I put it into Excel and I did everything like correctly, and mm -hmm. it and it didn't give me credit. Um, but I had noticed that um, the cells in the columns that it told me to put put it in, it was like the next uh, column and cell over in the Excel sheet. So I, I was wondering if I can like send you my um, my Excel assignment and the feedback and see if, if um, I can get some credit because I did everything the right way. Yeah, please but I send me an email that uh, attach it, uh, attach your uh, graded work uh, to that email. I, I kind of had the same issue with that. Yeah. That I tried to do a couple adjustments and they didn't give me credit for it for some odd reason. Yeah. Download your uh, graded uh, worksheet and attach it to an email. Explain the situation, explain what you did and what went wrong. I will review it. And uh, uh, if that's the case, I will basically adjust your grade accordingly. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Sure, sure. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, it's a rather light class today. It's 11 of us, where's everybody? Let's go ahead and get started. So today we will go over the second half of chapter 17. Uh, that concludes a chapter, uh, basically a quality controls and quality management in chapter 16. Remember, we talked about the concepts of quality management and we continued with the analytical part and built control charts, uh, uh, talked about X bar chart and R chart and the whole idea of a statistical process control. Today we will continue, uh, uh, basically we uh, uh, start with building an R chart. We'll do a little review on what was what were the control charts and how what were the formula. Then we will start with the uh, a R chart and we will move into P chart, C chart, and finish with um, basically another another aspect of quality control, which is process capability. Okay. So now let's get started with a little review of what we did. So let me go ahead and share this note with you. Okay, so let's take a look at this exhibit. So you might remember this from uh, our previous discussion. This is a general form of a uh, control chart, basically, okay? So if this is, for example, an X bar chart, uh, the formula for, so uh, essentially uh, any control chart has uh, a center line, an upper control limit, and a lower control limit, okay? For example, if this is a X bar chart, uh, your center line would be X double bar, and your upper control limit, if you remember, was X double bar plus A2 times R bar. And your lower control limit was X double bar minus A2 R bar, okay? So, and then we, uh, remember we did uh, do this manually and also did a, uh, uh, use the template and also built it in Excel ourselves, okay? Uh, the template that we used ha also had the capability of building the R bar chart, R chart, okay? So for R chart, if you remember, 
the let me move this a little oopsie so for our chart if you remember from our discussion the okay the mm, the center line for our chart was r bar okay so here was r bar and the uh, upper control limit was basically d4 times r bar and lower control limit was d3 times r bar okay so this this was basically uh, the two control charts that we reviewed so far okay let me make this a little more okay. now uh, let's go ahead and start working on building a r chart together okay so uh, again we will do it first uh, we, we did everything manually so we will go ahead and do this uh, using the Excel uh, and, we, and we did it also uh, using the Excel template. So we are just going to go ahead and build it in Excel from the scratch. And then we will come back and continue with P chart, C chart, and so on and so forth. Okay. So uh, let me go ahead and change the sharing because for this, I need the whole screen to be shared with you. And then I need to go ahead and go to the end of this chapter in mind tap so if you look here you see a lot of uh, interactive outlets uh, at the towards the end of this uh, session we will talk about a few of these and then under your assignments and tests you see that you have a, a couple of excel activities we, we did the export chart now we are going to go ahead and do the r chart okay so this is exactly the same question. Uh, the tire manufacturer uh, periodically tests its tires for thread wear under simulated road conditions. So it's basically exactly the same uh, situation. And uh, the only difference is that here we are building the uh, R chart. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started and see if we can go ahead and build this. And again, there's a video here available. So this is part of your assignment. There's a video available that you can go ahead and watch for uh, more instructions. Okay. So this is the Excel. I also need a little space here for formula. So let me change this little, make it a little smarter and bring the formula here. So these are the formula for R chart and X bar chart. Okay, so this is uh, the right side of the, your screen, the Excel uh, online Excel. Is this visible or is it too small? I think it's fine. It's fine. Everybody can see it. Yes, I can see it. Okay, perfect. Okay. So first thing that we need to do is to build the range of this, basically. Uh, 30 samples uh, for each of these 30 samples that we have, okay? So again, one uh, question for you, the million dollar question. What is the sample size here? Five. Five, very good. It is, is it not, it's not 30? So what is 30? the number of samples beautiful 30 is the number of samples okay so now let's go ahead and uh, calculate the range for each of these anybody remembers from our previous session how we calculate the range here come on don't be shy i know that you know the answer is it max very good B. maximum of this range very good minus minimum of 
exactly the same range. Okay, so that's going to give me my range and then I will go ahead and copy it down all the way. I get the range for all of these values. Okay, so now I need to build uh, my UCL and LCL. In order to get UCL and LCL, I need D3 and D4. Okay, so for that, I need to look up the values from this table. Okay, first thing that I need to do is to calculate the number of samples, although I can just go ahead and enter 30 in order to be... Uh, thorough and basically consistent, uh, we are going to use the count function. So we're counting the number of samples here. And again, for sample size also, I'm going to use count function. So I'm going to go ahead and use count. And then I need to calculate the average range. This is the R bar that I have here and here. Okay. So R bar is nothing but the average of all these values. So I would say average of values from here to here, that's gonna give me my R bar. Then I need to go ahead and read D3 and D4 from this table, okay? Anybody remember how do we did that? So manually, if you wanna do it, sample size is five, we go here, sample size is five. And here I have all the values from A2, D3, D4, and so on and so forth. So my D3 would be zero, D4 would be 2.11, but we used a little function to read it. What was that? VLOOKUP. Very good. So we used VLOOKUP, okay. So use VLOOKUP and the value that we are looking up is the sample size. And then the array that we are looking up from is this whole table. And then the column index for D3. So it is in the third column, one, two, three. So we'll say three, and that's gonna give me my D3. And the same formula only with the column index of four, gonna give me my <coughs> D4. So I'm basically repeating the same Thing, only the last piece of my argument is four. So now I have my D3 and D4. Now I'm gonna go ahead and use this formula here to build LCL and UCL. So LCL, as you can see here, is D3 times R bar. So it's gonna be uh, zero, which I have here. I need to unlock it, uh, basically use absolute cell reference and then use uh, asterisk times uh, R bar, which I have here, the average range. And that also needs to be locked because I want to copy it down. Okay, obviously it is zero, but again, since it's, it's in Excel slash OM assignment, we are going to use uh, as much Excel techniques and tools as we can. Okay, so center is basically going to be this average range that I have here. So that's pretty straightforward. We're just going to copy the value and uh, make it an absolute cell reference. And my UCL is going to be D4 times R bar. So D4 is here, lock it and copy it, uh, uh, multiply it by the average range or R bar and also use absolute cell reference for this one. Okay. And then I'll go ahead and copy everything down. All the formulas that I used are here. Okay, so if you want to go back and review they are all available here. Last piece is to build the actual chart. Okay, so in my chart, I need these three lines, basically center line, uh, LCL and UCL, and also the actual ranges to be plotted on this chart. So I will basically go ahead and uh, select everything, go to insert, go to insert to charts, and select the line chart with markers. Okay, so that's gonna be my control chart. Let's put it here. And now let's take a look at it. Interpretation is the important piece. What do you think? Is this a, a good process, bad process? Is it an uncontrolled process or is it not? Class is yours. Uh, it's a good process and, and, it's, and it's an control. Very good, it is in control, okay? You don't see anything below or above the uh, LCL and UCL. You don't see, you, you see almost uh, the same number of points below and above the center line. 
it is uh, randomly distributed. You don't see any patterns, any cyclical, uh, any trends, any cyclical patterns or anything of that nature. So we can say that, yes, it is a uh, in control process. So that concludes basically our X bar chart and R chart uh, discussion. Now we will start working on the next type of uh, chart, which is uh, P chart. Okay, and then after that, we will introduce C chart. So let me go back to my notes and start working on P chart. Okay, so before I start working on the P chart, uh, anybody remembers uh, when we uh, when we wanted to start this whole conversation, the discussion of uh, control charts, we talked about different types of variables. Okay, uh, anybody remembers what were those two different types of variables? It was um, continuous and discrete. Very good. Continuous variable, variables and discrete variables. And we said that for continuous variables, for continuous variables, we uh, use X bar chart and R charts. And, and for uh, discrete variables, we use P charts and C charts. Okay. A P chart, based on for the first thing that we need to notice here is that, that this is for discrete variables or metrics, okay? So basically when we count something, basically a P chart monitors the proportion of non-conforming items, okay? Proportion of error, okay? Another name for it is fraction non-conforming or fraction defective, okay? So basically this is proportion, P is for proportion, okay? Proportion or fraction of errors or defects. Okay, so we are monitoring the fraction or proportion of defects or errors. Okay, so uh, let's see how it works. Okay, so again, remember we, uh, in order to build, <coughs> in order to do all this statistical process control, and specifically for building these control charts, what we do is we do sampling, okay? So we gather samples, and each sa in each sample, we observe some uh, basically parameter or uh, statistic of, uh, of, uh, of interest, okay? So suppose that we take uh, K samples, okay? So we take K samples, so we have K is our number of samples, okay? And each sample is size N, okay? So my sample size is N, okay? So far, so good. So I took K samples and each sample size is, is a sample is of size N, okay? Now, suppose that in each sample, I have Y number of non-conforming items. Okay, so for example, in sample one, uh, Y1 is, for example, two, okay? In sample two, Y2 is three, and so on and so forth, okay? So I introduce something else, Y sub I, that's the number of errors or defects in sample I, okay? And then based on that, so since my sample size was N, the proportion of non-conforming or proportion of error in each sample would be Y divided by N, okay? So I will say PI or proportion of error is gonna be for each sample is gonna be equal to y sub i divided by n, okay? So y sub i divided by n will give me my proportion of error, okay? So far, so good. For example, suppose that I have a sample one, okay? And uh, let's say size of this sample is 10, 
and number of errors is two, okay? My P would be here, two tenth, okay? In sample two, again, size is 10. I have three errors, so it's gonna be three over 10. Sample three, again, 10. I have four errors, four, 10. Sample four, again, 10. I don't have any errors, so this is gonna be zero, and so on and so forth, okay? So this is basically how this Y and P work, okay? This is gonna be my P1, P2, P3, P4, all the way, and this is my PI, basically, okay? So far, so good. Okay, let me clear this up, continue our discussion. So now, one more thing that, so, so once that I calculated all those P values, P, P1, P2, P3, P4, I need to get an average of all those P values, okay? So average of all those P values would be P bar, okay? So P bar basically would be the average, let's write it this way. It's gonna be average of PIs or if you wanna put it in a formula, <coughs> it's gonna be total number of errors divided by the grand sample size, the size of all samples, okay? So it's basically gonna be y, y sigma yi divided by n times k, okay? Basically, all, all errors that you have in all samples divided by sample size times number of samples, okay? Or the average of all the PIs, P1, P2, P3, all the way to P30, for example, average of that gives me my uh, P bar, okay? So far, so good. Any questions? Are you sure? Perfect. Now, remember, we had in any, I said that in any uh, control chart, we have three lines, okay? The center line, and upper control limit and lower control limit. We said that here, in this case, in P chart, my center line is gonna be P bar, okay? And remember, we said that UCL and LCL are usually P, uh, our center line plus minus three standard deviation, okay? So in, for some calculations, it is um, basically easier to use some pre-calculated measures like A2, A3, a2, D3, D4, and so on. Here, we just uh, go ahead and build, calculate this uh, standard deviation, uh, multiply it by three, add it to the center line. This is gonna be my UCL, my, uh, minus the three standard deviation is gonna be my LCL, okay? So my UCL is basically gonna be P bar plus three times my standard deviation, and LCL is gonna be P bar minus three times my standard deviation, okay? So what does it mean? So far I have P bar, means that I need to go ahead and calculate the standard deviation, okay? So let's clear this up and see how we can go ahead and calculate the standard deviation. So standard deviation of proportion or S sub P is given by this formula, okay? So it is P bar, one minus P bar, divided by n, okay, this is sp bar. So standard deviation of the uh, proportion is the square root of uh, p bar or average of proportions of errors times one minus p bar divided by n, okay? So that's the formula. And then again, as I mentioned, my UCL p would be equal to p bar plus three times s of p and my LCLP would be equal to P bar minus three times S of P, okay? So this is basically the, all the formula that I need for calculating uh, UCL, LCL, and, and uh, the P bar itself, and uh, build the control chart, okay? Build P chart. Any questions so far? Are we good on all these formula that we talked about? Okay, so now let's see it in an example, okay? Let's see it in an example. Let's solve it manually first in an example. Then we introduce a, a template, work with an applet, and we'll do the uh, Excel activity, how to build it in Excel, okay? So let me go ahead and bring the question here.
So this is my uh, solve problem number 17. Three, uh, we have an automated sorting machine in a post office that must read the zip code on letters and divert the letters into the proper carrier routes. Uh, over a month's time, 25 samples of 100 letters were chosen and the number of errors were recorded. Number of errors in each sample is shown below. Construct a P chart. Okay, so let's see uh, if we can go ahead and do this step by step. Okay, so here, uh, my sample size. What is my sample size here? Jeremy, what is my sample size? Claire, what is my sample size? Is it 25? 25. Uh, Cameron, do you agree? Riley, what do you think? I'm not sure. Patricia, what do you think? Would it just be one? One, okay. Nancy, what do you think? 25. 25. Brett, what do you think? Is it 100 because they're taking 25 out of 100? Uh, that it is 100, not because they are taking 25 out of 100. They are taking 25 samples of 100. Okay, so each sample contains 100 letters. Okay, and they repeat this 25 times. Okay, the so size of each sample is 100. The number of samples is 25. Thank you, that's correct. So number of uh, samples is, let's go ahead and write these down. So my number of samples is 25 my sample size or n is 100 okay so now <coughs> let's go ahead and use the formula that we just learned to build this chart okay first thing that we need to do is to calculate p bar okay so for calculating p bar remember the formula was sigma yi divided by n times k okay so so sigma yi is the addition of all these values okay all these values that i have here if i add them all together gives me 55 so 55 errors in all these 25 samples okay so that's my uh, sigma yi 25 divided by n times k n is uh, 100 and k is 25 okay so it's going to be 25 times 100 okay so you'll see that my uh basically <coughs> i'm sorry my this uh, numerator give me one second The numerator is 55, okay? The, the total number of errors, as you remember, it's like right here, it's 55. So sigma yi is 55 divided by 25 times 100. This will give me 0.022, okay? So 0.022, that's gonna be my p bar, okay? So, so far I have built the center line of my uh, p chart. Then I need to go ahead and calculate S sub P bar to be able to calculate the uh, UCL and LC. Okay, so S sub P bar, if you remember, the formula was P bar one minus P bar divided by N. This would be 0 0.022, one minus 0 0.022. Divided by 100. Okay, and that will give me 0.1467. Okay, 
Okay, so that's my S sub P. Then I can go ahead and build UCL and LCL. So UCL P is P bar plus three times S sub P, which would be equal to 0 0.022 plus three times 0.1467. And that would be equal to uh, 0 0.066. 066 and my LCL using the same formula P bar minus three times S sub P. I skipped the uh, intermediate calculations is going to be a uh, negative 0 0.022. Okay, so uh, I have my P bar and I have my LCL and I have my UCL, okay? So what is wrong with these calculations? Everything is good, but there's a little catch. There's a little problem here. While I'm building my chart, go ahead and tell me what, what do you think is wrong here? Nothing wrong, everything's good. Nope, today is my, not my lucky day. So this is my P bar, which is 0 0.022. This is my UCL, which is 0 0.066. And this is my LCL, which is minus 0 0.022, okay? So tell me, what is happening here? What is wrong? There's Anything a, seems off to you? Go ahead. There's a negative LCL. Mm-hmm. So what should I do? Assume it's zero. Why? That's correct. Thank you, that's correct answer. So whenever we have a negative value, we assume zero, okay? Why is that? Because it wouldn't be efficient to go below zero. Uh, any, any other thoughts? What are these values? What are these, uh, these UCLP, LCLP, P bar, P? value in general. What is P? P stands for? Uh, proportions of errors or defects. Proportion, okay. You so can't have a negative error. There you go. You don't have negative proportion, okay? That's the answer. Very good. So whenever we see uh, in the P chart and C chart, it happens a lot. We get a lot of negative values. Whenever it happens, we just uh, assume that it is zero, okay? So this is a manual calculations, but uh, we have a, uh, we, we don't need to do manual calculations. It's just for the sake of knowing what's happening behind the scene, basically, okay? What we uh, usually do is that we go ahead and use our p-chart uh, template, okay? So let's go ahead and see the p-chart template real quick together. And then after that, we will solve it in Excel ourselves, okay? So this is my P-chart. This is exactly the same problem that we just reviewed, okay? Uh, again, like all other P, all other uh, templates, uh, you only enter your data in the yellow cells. So this is your sample size of 100, number of samples of 25, and then you go ahead and enter your number of errors or number of non-conformance here in these cells. And then it will do all the calculations for you. It, it calculates the uh, number of, uh, the fraction of non-conforming, which is your P. So this is P1, P2, all the way to P25. Then it calculates the standard deviation. LCL is zero because it was a negative value. UCL and <coughs> center line. And based on that, it, cap it basically builds the P chart for you. Again, let's take a look at this P chart and see if we can interpret it. Interpreting, interpretation of the uh, control charts is the most important part of our work. What do you think? Everything is good? Out of control, in control? Class is yours. 
out? Out of control. Why? Because number four. Because of number four. Okay, what's it's happening in number four? It goes past our LCL. It goes past LCL. Let's take a look. Okay, so number four here. We have zero errors. Okay, and oh, is it zero? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then my LCL is zero, so it is zero. So it's it looks like it's going down. But no, my LCL is zero and it is zero as well. Okay, what else? It hits the bottom threshold multiple times. Uh huh. Uh huh. So th th that's a good point. By itself, is it a concern? Yes, because you don't want to hit the threshold if possible. Like, Especially multiple times at that. Very good. Multiple times. That, that's the key. Okay. So it hit the bottom threshold. If it hits bottom threshold in uh, multiple times in a consecutive manner. Okay. So one after another. Okay. And it doesn't go up and come back down. That's a concern. Okay. So it hit the bottom threshold here, 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 and here. But between these, you have a lot of fluctuation, okay? Basically, you have random variation here, you have random variation here, and you have random variation here. And one more thing, remember, in a p-chart, when it hits bottom, it's a good thing. It means that you, you don't have any errors, okay? So uh, by itself, it is not a concern. However, it, if it repeats, if it doesn't pick up after that, it means that there is something wrong, okay? There's something wrong with your building the chart, something wrong with the uh, measurement, maybe this chart in, in itself is too big for uh, finding the errors here and so on and so forth, okay? But then no, uh, by itself, it's not a concern in this specific case. And again, I see that uh, uh, almost the same number of uh, points above the center line and below the center line. I don't have a trend. I don't have a cyclical pattern. I don't have eight consecutive lines above or below and so on and so forth. So this is a chart that I can say is in control, okay? Any questions? Are you sure? Perfect. Now let's go ahead and see if we can build this P chart in Excel. So I will close this and go ahead and share again my whole screen with you. Then we go to the end of this chapter and let's do the Excel activity P chart. Okay, so this is exactly the same question that we just saw. Now we are basically doing it ourselves. So we are uh, solving it all manually. Uh, again, please tell me if it is uh, big enough and is visible or you need me to basically magnify it a little bit. Nothing? So uh, first thing that we need to calculate is the uh, average p-bar. Average p-bar is given with this formula. My p-bar is basically all uh, the errors that I have, number of non-conformance or number of errors divided by sample size times number of samples, okay? So what I go ahead and do is I uh, calculate the sum of sum of all these values. These are my number of errors divided by uh, n times k. n here is 200 and k is number of samples is 25. So that is my average p-bar. That's, that's the value that goes in the middle of my uh, p-chart. <clears throat> Standard deviation is given by this formula. Uh, so I go ahead and build it here, uh, square root as SQRT. And here I have P bar one minus P bar in the numerator. So this is gonna be P bar times one minus P bar. And that is all in the numerator divided by Okay. 
that's all in the numerator, divided by uh, 200, okay? And close friends again, okay? Your sample size. So, So that's my uh, standard deviation. And then, and now that I have my standard deviation, I go ahead and calculate UCL and P, uh, LCLP. The UCL is P bar plus three times SLP and LCL is P bar minus three times SLP. So uh, my LCL is my P bar minus three times standard deviation. And my UC, uh, UCL is P bar plus three times the standard deviation. Okay, everything's good here. Anything wrong with this calculations? If the LCL is zero, it's if the LCL is supposed to be zero. What should we do there? Because it's negative there. It is negative. Yeah. What should I do? A filter. Filter, okay, go ahead, uh, how can I do that? How can I change this to zero in Excel? I can, I can visually look at it and see it's negative and make it a zero, but I want you to give me a uh, method that you have learned in Excel. I think it's a filter, I'm not too sure. Okay, tell me how, how, should, I, how should I do that? I use a different type of Excel, so my format looks different than that okay. one. Okay. Any other thoughts? It's a negative value. I want a, a command or something that returns a zero. I want a machine that gets a negative value and it spits out a zero. Could you okay. use an if formula? We can do the F, if formula. Yes, we can do if. We can say that if takes this value, if this is uh, less than zero, get me, uh, give me zero. If it is more than zero, give me the actual value, the, the value itself. But there is a very easier, much, 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 much easier way. Any thoughts? It's a very basic formula that you can use, okay? You can use the max formula, okay? Use maximum of zero and this number, okay? Whichever is greater, okay? If this value is positive, this value would be shown. If it is negative, zero would be greater. So zero would be shown, okay? So this is one of the tricks that you can use to basically get rid of negative values. Again, as I mentioned, uh, F function also would work here, okay? So now here, we need to fill in this uh, table, okay? So we need to have the uh, standard deviation, fraction non-conformance, LCL, UCL, and so on. I skipped that standard deviation. It's not necessary because we already calculated it on, on the top, or you can just go ahead and read it from here. So we can say this is standard deviation and lock it uh, with dollar signs and then copy it all the way down, okay? That's for the sake of being complete, okay? The fraction non-conformance is gonna be the number of non-conformance in that sample divided by sample size, okay? My sample size is 200, and I, since I want to copy it down, I will lock that 200, and then I will copy this down. So this is, these are gonna be my PIs, so P1, P2, P3, all the way to uh, P25. And remember, the average of these values will give me also this average. So there are two methods of calculating the P bar. So for LCL, it's gonna be my uh, average, uh, LCL and UCL are already calculated, so my LCL is right here. I just uh, read it and use absolute cell reference and copy it all the way down. My center line is my average P bar. I read it from here, make it absolute cell reference, copy it all the way down, and same thing here, my UCL lock it and copy it, okay? So this is, this. these four basically construct my P-chart. Again, I select them all, go to insert, 
go to a line chart with markers and that is my p chart okay so although the question is the same numbers are a little different so uh, my p chart is also a different p chart okay so again take a look at this and tell me if it is a in control process or not an in control process Carlos, what do you think? Um, I think it looks I th like based off what we just talked about, um, that it could be in control or that it is in control. Very um, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is in control, yes. As you can see that there is nothing above or below the center line, uh, the uh, control lines. Uh, control limits and uh, we have almost the same number of points above and below it is randomly distributed we don't I don't see a pattern I don't see a cyclical pattern I don't see a trend I don't have eight consecutive lines uh, points above or below so it is a I can assume I can uh, conclude that it's a uh, in it's an in control process okay so now let's go back to our notes and work on another type of chart which is p chart uh, c chart okay so let's go back and start working on c charts so c chart uh again remember p charts were for proportion okay but c chart is basically for count okay so when do we use p chart and when do we use c chart okay whenever we are uh, taking samples of size more than one okay we use p charts whenever we our samples are only one okay meaning that we have one instance of, of, of something happening but in that one instance we have multiple number of errors we have multiple number of non-conformance, okay? Basically, a p-chart monitors the proportion of non-conformance items, but these non-conforming items could be more than one, okay? So in these cases, we use a c-chart, c, starts, a c stands for count, okay? So we need to, we are, in this case, we are monitoring the number of errors for each sample which is always of size one okay so whenever we are doing a c chart sample size is always one okay so a c chart basically monitors the total number of errors or defects or non-conformance per unit okay when the size of the sampling unit or number of opportunities for error is constant meaning it is uh, equal to uh, one okay so uh, on a p-chart, if you remember, we plot the fraction of non-conformance. In a c-chart, we plot the number of non-conformance or count of non-conformance, okay? So let's talk about c-chart and what formula we use here. So c-chart. Uh, this is for, uh, the formula here is rather straightforward. It's pretty, pretty simple. So c stands for count okay and uh first thing that we need to have here is c bar okay so c bar is basically the average number of non-conformance per unit okay so for example uh if you have a sample of like 25 and there are a number of uh, non-conformance there then uh we take those non-conformances divided by uh, that uh, the 20, 25 okay so that's going to give me my c bar okay so c bar is the count of errors or defects or non-conformances okay and then i have my ucl and lcl which are c bar plus and minus three times standard deviation. Standard deviation here is gonna be estimated by the square root of C bar, okay? So it's pretty straightforward. So it's three times square root of C bar and three times the square root of C bar, 
Okay. So basically, the calculations are very, very straightforward. There is nothing much to uh, do here. Okay. So let's take a look at an example first manually, then using the template, and then we will see uh, if we can build it in Excel. Okay. So this is solve problem number 17 4. Let me copy and paste it here. Okay, so let's take a look here. Each day a factory counts the number of mach uh, machine failures and wants to plot the number of failures per day on a C chart. A C chart is appropriate because each day there may be multiple machine failures or non-conformances, okay? So again, the sample size here is always one, okay? We have 25 samples. The number of samples is 25 and the number of failures each day is recorded. So for example, day one, there are two failures, there are two, but we, it's always one machine, okay? But uh, and there are multiple failures, okay? So uh, what we need to do first, we need to calculate my C bar, okay? So C bar uh, is gonna be uh, number of failures divided by number of samples, okay? So number of errors, number of failures, whatever it is, uh, divided by number of samples, okay? So in this case, uh, number of, total number of uh, defects, defects or errors is 45. So I take 45 and divided by the number of samples, which is 25. And that gives me 1.8, okay? It means that I, by on average, I have 1.8 failures per day, okay? Per sample, okay? Now, based on this, I'm gonna go ahead and use the formula that I introduced at the top. So UCL C bar is gonna be equal to C bar plus three times square root of C bar. So that would be 1.8 plus three times square root of 1.8, and that would be 5.82. Then same way, I calculate LCL C bar, which is gonna be C bar minus three times square root of C bar. Again, 1.8 minus three times square root of 1.8, and that would be negative 2.22, which is zero. Again, we don't have negative count, same way that we don't have negative proportion, we don't have negative count, okay? So that's it. I calculated my C bar, which is the value in the middle. I calculated my UCL and I calculated my LCL. Therefore, I have my uh, control chart. So I built my control chart. My C bar here is 1.8. My UCL is 5.82 and my LCL is zero. Okay. So far so good. So this is the manual calculations. Again, pretty straightforward. The next, the last step is just to plot all the counts. But again, we are not going to use uh, manual calculations. We just did it to, uh, to see what's happening behind the scene, okay? Uh, what do we do? We use the uh, template that, are, that is available to us. So let's take a look at the template together real quick. Here is the C chart template. So as you can see, again, the, the only thing that you need to enter is the number of non-conformances, okay? number of defects, number of errors. You just go ahead and enter them all here. This is again, a number of samples here in this case is, third, uh, is 25. It's basically the same problem that we had. And basically there's no calculations after that. Uh, once you enter that, uh, enter those numbers, everything would be calculated and you get your chart, okay? So this is my C chart. 
Now, uh, again, this, uh, this should be uh, easy to interpret. What do you think about this process? In control, out of control, anything wrong, anything to worry about? Uh, there's nothing to worry about. It's in control. This process is in control. Very good. Yes, that's a in control process. It basically checks all the boxes. So we are good. Okay. So now let's go ahead and let's see if we can build an X, uh, SC chart. Okay. So I need to share again my whole screen with you. And here I have the C chart. This is again the end of the uh, chapter, click on the Excel activity for C chart. Let's close this and let's see how it works. Okay. Again, this is the same question, number of machine failures. Let's just, uh, and there's a video that you can watch. This is, this is part of your assignment. Let's open the spreadsheet, bring it here and start working on it. Okay. So here I have uh, my number of samples is 25. My first, I need to calculate the average C bar, okay, average uh, number of errors. So that would be basically the average function of these values. And then for standard deviation, standard deviation is basically your square root of C bar. So it's going to be SQRT of this value that I calculated, my LCL would be equal to average minus three times uh, standard deviation. And my UCL is going to be average plus three times standard deviation. Again, in order to get rid of this negative value, I can use that same trick maximum of zero and that value, and that returns a zero here, okay? So I just need to copy these values here. My LCL is this value, absolute cell reference. CL is, uh, center line is my C bar. Uh, again, absolute cell reference. My UCL is this value. Again, absolute cell reference. And so basically this is my, these are my uh, three lines and these are the number of non-conformances. So let's copy everything. I need to copy this first down. Copy and down. These are the number of non-conformances and also the three lines. I go ahead and insert a chart and the rest is interpretation of the results. Okay, again, as you can see here, we don't see any problem. Uh, basically checks this, this chart as well, checks all the boxes and it, we have a, an in control process. Okay, so we covered all the charts that we had in this chapter. We covered X bar chart, P chart, C chart, and X bar chart, R chart, C chart, and P chart, okay? And uh, we did it manually, we did it using uh, the Excel template and they also built it in Excel, okay? Any questions on, on any of these? Are you sure? Okay, so now that you don't have any questions, let's take a look at these templates, these uh, applets that are available to you. Let's work with a few of these. Let me change the sharing, don't need that much of a screen anymore. Mm, okay. So first, uh, there, there's a lot of interactive applets here. Some of them are your homework. You need to basically deal with, uh, work, play with them and answer a number of questions. So let's review them real quick, okay? So uh, first, this is a P-chart, okay? This is a P-chart here that you have. And every time that you click on this graph, it basically gives you another random sample of 25, okay? 25 samples, it basically draws 25 samples and basically does all the calculations behind the scene and plot one uh, big P chart for you. So this is uh, how you interact with it. And then based on that, you can go ahead and answer some questions, okay? So here we have a P chart that is in control 
and then we have a, a p chart that is out of control okay so for the p chart uh, out of control you see that you need to be able to see why these p charts are out of control so let's take a look at a few of them uh, for example this one what do you see here why this p chart is out of control or is it out of control at all Hello. Um, it is out of control. It is out of control. Why? Because there's just so many um, points consecutively um, under the center line in this case, and then consecutively over the center line. So like it's not. Okay, I I give this a B plus. Okay, so many. How many? Three. 30, 55, 100, how many points under or below? Below or above the center line? Eight. Eight consecutive, minimum. yes, eight consecutive. So show me where are those eight consecutive points? Would on the line count as being, yeah. would you include those? It does, yes. Yeah. Oh, from zero to 15 then. Very good. So you see that all these values are below and all these values are above, okay? Also, this is eight is uh, either below or above. Also, we have 10 out of 12 consecutive, okay, above or below, and then we have 12 out of 15. So go ahead and read that section. That, that section is very important. Interpretation of these charts is pretty important, okay? So that's a P chart that you need to can interact with, and there are two assignments. Assignments are pretty straightforward. Just click on the chart and answer a few questions. And then we have C charts, okay? Uh, again, the same basically a format and technique. You click on it every time it draws a uh, basically uh, a sample of 25 and, uh, and basically builds a, builds a C chart for you. So let's take a look at this, this uh, C chart, for example. Is it out of control, in control? What's happening here? Uh, Nate, what do you think? Hernan, what do you think? Shouldn't it, isn't it out because of, I think, 12? It's above 6. This value? Yeah, that one. That value is exactly on the line. OK, so the graph is a little, uh, uh, the re representation of graph is uh, shows it as outside, but it's not outside. It's exactly on the line, OK? So we can say that this process is also in control. We don't have eight consecutive one, two, three, four, five, six. So we don't have eight consecutive. We don't have 10 out of 12. And so it is a, an in-control process. And again, these are basically correcting themselves. So it, it hits the bottom, but then again, it, it picks up and it hits the top and again, it goes down. So they are being corrected. So this is a in-control process, okay? Now let's take a look at these. These are out of control examples for C-chart. So again, you see that uh, number of, uh, so many number of units, uh, number of points below or above. You see that obviously these values are out, uh, 10 out of 12 consecutive and so on and so forth. So this is another part of your assignment dealing with P charts and C charts and um, answering a number of questions on that front. Okay. So this basically concludes the uh, control charts section of our work, okay? Now, a few th things about control charts that we need to be aware of when we are deal working with them. Let me go ahead and change sharing here so I can write those for you. Okay, first thing is that when you are uh, 
working with a Six Sigma process. Six Sigma processes, uh, you cannot use control charts in them, okay? So control charts when they are, and when you're using, it's usually uh, for uh, Sigma pro processes with, with a lower Sigma, okay? So first thing that's the need to, so these are notes. First, uh, control charts basically cannot be used in Six Sigma processes, okay? And the reason is that Six Sigma processes are uh, basically too good to be uh, evaluated by a control chart, and they will show a very, very small, even if you take a very large sample, they will take show a very, very small variation. So different, different methods should be used, okay? And, uh, uh, another thing that sample size should be, although big sample size are good, but uh, practically speaking, we always look for small sample sizes because uh, we want to keep the cost of sampling low. Okay, so cost of sampling is something that we need to be aware of. That's why we use small sample sizes. Okay. And uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, throughout. So usual, usually samples of size five to um, found, to be, found to be working well, okay? Larger sample size of uh, 15 to 25 are usually you know, good when you want to find a very small shift in the process, okay? So sample size is usually around five. One more thing is that for P charts, okay, uh, for P charts, uh, the if sample size is too small, so that that uh, what we talked about is for X bar chart and R chart. But but there's a what basically are uh, all uh, P, uh, all control charts. But P chart is basically an exception. In P chart, um, a, sam a small sample size is meaningless. Okay, uh, if you take an S, take a small sample size. Uh, P chart would be basically meaningless. There is a calculation to find out what is the good sample size, but again, we, we skip that. And we just take uh, this rule of thumb that usually number of at least 100 observations per sample should be there. So when you are doing a P chart, usually my sample size should be above 100, okay? So, and then uh, for uh, smaller p-values, uh, this uh, sample size can go all the way up to at least 300. For example, p, if p-value is 0 0.01, it's pretty small, uh, the sample size should go all the way to 300, okay? And uh, again, as, as I mentioned, there are some calculations to be able to find out the right sample size, but uh, it's the little is outside, outside of the scope of our work, so we don't cover it here. Okay, so these are the notes and caveats for, uh, for uh, control charts. Now let's go to the next piece of our work here, and which is process capability. Okay. So process capability, remember when we started this whole idea of uh, uh, SPC and last time in chapter 17, we talked about, uh, we talked about uh, normal variation and we talked about uh, basically um, assignable cause variation and common cause variation. Process capability is another name for the natural variation or common cause variation in a process, okay? So process capability is all about natural variation, okay? In a process, okay? Uh, and then uh, it, it is usually uh, estimated with a normal distribution, okay? And uh, in order to find, uh, to do the uh, analysis, we do something called a process capability study, which is a study designed to find the specific information about the performance of a process, okay? We wanna basically see how our process is working under uh, 
specified conditions. Okay, so let's take let's take a look at uh, this in a more uh, meaningful way. Let's see uh, what we are talking about. Mainly, we are uh, uh, we are interested in knowing what is the center of our process and what is the variability of our process. Okay, so suppose that this is a process that I have. Okay, this is a process that I have. And the mean of this process is mu, okay? And uh, this is mu plus three sigma, and this is mu minus three sigma, okay? So from uh, statistics class, remember that the area between these two values, the area that you have here, This area is 99.7%, okay? So this is uh, somewhat is called the natural variation, okay? And uh, we usually say that the process is in control. Uh, if uh, a large percentage of my output is between these two basically limits, mu minus three sigma and mu plus three sigma. Okay, so this is about the process itself, okay? Now, the process capability is comparison between this uh, basically variation of the process, okay? And the, the design specifications, okay? So basically we take this natural variation in the process and compare it with the design specifications, okay? So what are we talking about? What do I mean by design spec? So let's take a look. So suppose that this is my process and suppose that this is my specification, okay? So my specification says that my mm, lower specification limit, okay, is right here. And my upper specification limit is here, okay? So you see that the design specification okay, and the var my variation are exactly the same, okay? So this distance, I will call it design specification. This is design spec. And this distance is basically my observed variation, okay? So this is my observed variation okay so in this case you see that this is an this is one example you see that my observed variation and my design specification are exactly the same okay in this case i am i have a capable process okay so we'll call this a capable process okay and i am happy okay because my process is basically meeting this spec okay now so let's see another example let's see if my process is, for example, like this. So this is my process. Okay. And my USL and NLSL are here, okay? So this is my USL and this is my LSL, okay? So what I see is that my design spec, so my is greater than the observed variation, okay? So you see that my spec is 
greater than variation. Okay, this is also a capable process. It's even a better process. Okay, so I'm still happy. Okay, in this case, the spec was equal to variation, and this in this case, the spec is better than or bigger than variation, okay? or variation is smaller than spec. So it's still I have a capable process. Okay. Now let's take a look at another example. Let's suppose that I have a specification here that my UCL is right here. I'm sorry, USL is right here. And my LSL is right here, okay? So this is my LSL and USL, okay? So you see that in this case, I have a design spec which is much smaller, okay? So this is my design spec. You see that my design spec is much smaller than the variation, meaning that variation of my process goes out of the specification limits, okay? This is a incapable process, okay? So this is not capable, okay? My process is not good is not meeting the customer specification, okay? So this is a visual way to see it, uh, if the process is in uh, is capable or not. But then we uh, have a measure for calculating the process capability, and that's called process capability index, okay? So in order to calculate the process capability, we have a measure called process capability index, okay? And process capability index is basically a very straightforward form, has a very straightforward formula, okay? Uh, it is, uh, it, we show it with CP, and it is basically USL minus LSL divided by six sigma, okay? Why are, what, where, where, where are we getting these values? Remember this, uh, and this first one, this distance between these two, okay, is six sigma. I have three sigmas here and three sigmas here. This is six sigma. And this is my USL minus LSL, okay? So if these two are exactly the same, my numerator and denominator are the same, so CP is gonna be one. So it's a capable process. If it is a smaller, it's gonna be less than one. It's an incapable process. If it is bigger than one and so on and so forth. So this is where I am getting these basically uh, values in the formula for uh, process capability index, okay? So CP is USL minus LSL divided by six sigma. And then again, uh, the criteria here is that if CP is less than one, it is a not capable process, okay? Process is not capable. And then uh, CP of one is a capable process. And a CP of two means it's a six sigma process, okay? So anything above one is desirable, two and above is a six sigma process, okay? Sometimes I have a process shift, meaning that my mean is not exactly on the target, okay? The mean of my process is not exactly on the specification target. In, that, in those cases, I break down this formula into two pieces, okay? And calculate two things. So when, when process mean is off target, what we do is we calculate two things. First, calculate CPU, and then we calculate CPL, okay? Lower process capability and upper process capability. Upper process capability is gonna be USL minus mu divided by three sigma, and lower uh, uh, process capability is gonna be mu minus LSL divided by three sigma, okay? And then my CP or CPK, basically process capability index, is gonna be minimum of these two values, minimum of CPU and CPL, okay? 
screen. So again, uh, we will see all of these in a, an example that will explain what is happening. Okay. And again, for all of that, we have a, a template. So I'm not really worried about that. Okay. So let's take a look at this example together and see if we can go ahead and calculate the process capability. So here is a uh, we have a prop uh, we have a observation of 120 measurements of the dimension of a manufactured part uh, for an automobile which is taken from a control process. We need to find the process capability index. Okay, so process capability index uh, we have the we have our uh, basically upper specification and lower specification. This nominal specification is the target. Okay. This upper specification is USL and this is LSL, okay? So we have my USL and LSL. And then based on those, we can go ahead and use these three formula to build my CP, okay? So let's go ahead and get started with building this, okay? So my CP is calculated with this formula. It is USL minus LSL divided by six sigma, okay? So my USL is 10.9, my LSL is 10.5, and my sigma or standard deviation, I need to go ahead and get the standard deviation of all these values. Again, we are not gonna ever do the uh, manual calculations, but uh, and, and we do it in Excel. So basically, in, by any means, if you can go ahead and calculate the standard deviation of all the values, the standard deviation here uh, is calculated to be 0 0.0868, okay, standard deviation or sigma. Uh, let's estimate up 0 0.0868. So from this old table. So I will just plug it this, plug this in here, eight, six, eight. And that would give me a process capability of 0.768. Okay, so 0.768, this is less than one. So it's not a capable process. Okay, I am unhappy. Now, uh, this process is slightly off target. Okay, this process is, uh, a little off target, meaning that if I go ahead and calculate the mean of these values, all these values, if I get the average of them, the average here is 10.7171, okay? So 10.7171, okay? You see that my uh, target is 10.7, okay? And my uh, process mean is 10.71. So if I stay with one decimal, my process is on target. If I go a little, uh, be, want to be a little more accurate, my process is off target. So both calculations work. So let's assume that it is off target, okay? So 7171, if it is off target, we are going to use the second formula. We calculate CPU and CPL, okay? So CPU is USL minus mu, divided by three sigma, okay? So my USL is 10.9 and my mu is 10.7171. And this divided by three sigma. So three times 0 0.0868. That will give me 0.833. And I calculate CPL as well. CPL is going to be mu minus LSL, the other side 
uh, divided by three sigma. And that would be 10.7171 minus 10.5 divided by three times 0 0.0868, which will give me uh, 0 0.0702, okay? 0 0.702, okay? And then my CPK or process capability index would be minimum of CPU and CPL, okay? which would be the minimum of these two values, okay? Minimum of these two values is gonna be 0.702. Again, I see that my process is not capable, okay? So again, as I mentioned, we don't need to do any of these calculations manually because we have a Excel template available to us. Uh, we just did it to show what is the calculations that we are basically taking for granted. So the uh, template is, again, as always, available on Moodle and MindTap. It is called Process Capability Template. So let me go ahead and share that screen with you. Okay, so this is the Process Capability Template. Again, here, we need first to put the spec here. So what is the target that my customer wants? What is the upper specification limit? What is the lower specification limit? Okay, these are the customer requirements, customer specification. And then this is, these are all my samples, okay? So I took basically 10 samples of 12 observations, okay? So day one, I took 12 observations. Day two, I took 12 observations and so on and so forth. It could be the other way as well, okay? I have uh, uh, 10, 10 days of sampling and 12 observations each day, okay? Or 12 uh, samples, 10 observations each day. Either way works. So once you enter everything, it calculates the average and standard deviation, CP, CPL, CPU, and CPK. And you can see that if your process is in control or not, okay? On top of this, it also creates a little uh, histogram for you that basically shows what is happening with your process. This is basically a, an estimation of that normal curve that uh, we drew, if you remember, okay? So it basically shows you what is the variation of your process, okay? And you can basically overlay your uh, design spec, 10.9 10 and 10.5 here, okay? So you see that, for example, if I zoom in here, you see that my 10.5 is around here and 10.9 is around here. So you see that I have values outside of 10.9. So my process is uh, going out of the specification limit, going, goes above the specification limit and basically is not meeting the customer specifications. That's why my CP values are low. Okay, my CP values are less than one. Okay, so this is the uh, process capability template that you can go ahead and use. Also, at the end of the chapter, there's a Excel activity in which you will go ahead and build this uh, uh, CP calculations of, from scratch in Excel. Okay, let's take a look at that as well real quick, and then we can call it a day. So uh, what am I sharing right now? Okay, so again, if you go to the end of chapter, you see that here we have a little Excel activity for process capability. If you click on that, it, will get, it has a, a video tutorial and basically you are building that uh, template that we just saw together, okay? So let's take a look and see if we can build it. So these are the formula that we use for process capability. CP is USL minus LSL divided by six sigma, okay? So the most important piece of uh, calculation is right here, okay? First, we need to calculate the average, and then we need to get the standard deviation. Then we can, based on that, calculate CP, CPU, CPL, and CPK. Okay, so average is a straightforward. We just go ahead and get the average of all these values that we have here, all the data points that I have. Standard deviation, for standard deviation, be careful. This is a little tricky part. You need, when you uh, 
a plugin STD, you get uh, a lot of different st standard deviations. So standard deviation, the generic formula for standard deviation is STDEV, okay? But we have different types. In this case, we are using STDV.S, okay? It's basically when you are uh, calculating standard deviation of a sample, okay? So we are using this, since this is a sample, we are using STDV.S and this is basically my average and my standard deviation. Now, based on these, using this formula, I can go ahead and calculate CP first, okay? So my CP is USL minus LSL. My USL and LSL are given here. So I do open prints. This is my USL and this is my LSL. This is then my numerator divided by six sigma, okay? Six times my standard deviation, which I just calculated here. That gives me my CP. Again, you see my CP is really bad. It is less than five, less than one. It's pretty low, okay? Then uh, I can go ahead and calculate CPL and CPU. You see that my process is slightly off target. It is 10.89, my average and my nominal spec is 10.9. So it is slightly off target. So it's not a bad idea to calculate CPL and CPU as well. So my CPU, CPL is mu minus LSL divided by three sigma. So my, in the numerator, I have mu, which is average minus LSL divided by three sigma, three times my standard deviation. And my CPU is gonna be my L, USL minus mu divided by, again, three sigma, three times my standard deviation. So that uh, calculates my CPU and CPL. And then my CPK would be minimum of these two values. So here I would just go ahead and use the minimum function of this and this, okay? Or you can just, just select a range. So I calculated all these CP, CPL, CPU, and CPK. The rest of this is uh, basically manually building that histogram, okay? So you can go ahead and watch the video and follow the steps to build the histogram. Uh, there's also another method to build the histogram in Excel. You can just uh, use all these values and go ahead and build a histogram. There's a little technicality here. This, the, these um, columns need to be stacked uh, basically on top of each other. It should be just one column if you want to use the Excel uh, function for building a histogram. So either way works. And when we are solving the problems, I will touch upon that and show you how this can be done, uh, both, in, both using the Excel built-in histogram function and also using this method of building each bin and then building a bar chart that gives you the histogram, okay? But that's not the important piece. The important piece is calculating all these uh, process capabilities, okay? So that is that. And let me stop sharing here. And that's, this basically concludes our chapter 17. Uh, what you need to do is to go ahead and uh, solve the problems and also answer the questions on the test, uh, basically the, the conceptual assignment that you have. On top of that, as you saw, we have you have a, a number of Excel activities and also a number of templates. We solved basically all of them in class, so your workflow should be uh, much easier. Uh, whenever you have a problem, go back to these videos and take a look. Uh, they are all going to be due in one week next Thursday. Uh, next week, when we meet on Tuesday, we solve the problems and questions of chapter 16. Uh, on Thursday, we solve the problems and questions of chapter 17. And by, uh, if we have time, there might be some other activity, most probably on Tuesday, okay? So that concludes all our work on quality management. And uh, if there are any questions, I would be able to answer them. Please stay on the call. Otherwise, I hope you have a great uh, rest of your week and a great weekend, and I will see you on Tuesday. Thanks, Papa. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Thank Welcome. you.
Пока.